So our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Joaquin Martins, has contributed to the theoretical foundations that underpin OpenMDO really since the project's beginning. There was an early meeting in 2008, uh, which I think he'll talk about or possibly make fun of me in. Um, throughout the day, today and tomorrow, you're going to actually hear a lot of talks from University of Michigan folks, mostly from his lab, which I think underpins the influence that he's really had on the project. Uh, in fact, I'm lucky enough to count myself amongst one of his former students. Uh, so today, Professor Martins is going to share his perspective on the evolution of derivative computation, uh, of which he basically inspired the inclusion of those features in OpenMDAO, and how that relates to the project's development. This is a bit of a personal perspective. Uh, on the evolution of uh, derivative computation. I'm going to go in chronological order from the very first uh, couple that joint is barely working, not scalable, through a unified derivatives and OpenMDAO. So I think a lot of you are familiar with those components. Okay, so um, yeah, so for my thesis when I was a PhD student, um, got inspiration from two main streams of, of research. Uh, one was um, on the side of my, one of my advisors was Professor Elan Crow um, on MDO of aircraft configurations with lowish fidelity. So there was a student who had just graduated, uh, Sean Wakayama, who's now at Boeing, who did this really nice thesis on MDO for a full aircraft. Um, with low fidelity tools, conceptual level, but already coupling a panel code to a beam code. And he had this approach that actually inspired a future work in my lab, which was uh, an approach where he introduced physics gradually, understand the optimizations you're getting at each step, and gradually introduce the number of variables. So you can see here, I went from uh, minimum induced drag with no viscous effects, then adding viscous effects, and eventually getting a, um, a reasonable plan form. Uh, and on the other side, the high fidelity side, um, took a lot from my former advisor, uh, Juan Alonso, uh, who did a lot of work on uh, adjoints for aerodynamic optimization uh, when he was working with uh, Professor Jamieson. Um, so a lot of that uh, inspiration owes to that uh, previous work. And in particular, that culminated in the work with uh, uh, Alonzo and Reuter on the aerodynamic optimization of full configurations. Okay, so this was back in 1999. It was absolutely state of the art uh, at the time. So my idea was to somehow do this, but in high fidelity. So combining aerodynamics and structures. Um, and one of the papers that really um, allowed me to do this was the paper by uh, Sobieski on the sensitivity of coupled systems, where he derived this uh, global, he called it global sensitivity equations. And there were two versions, GSE1, GSE2. I call them the residual form and the functional form of the direct method. So this is an, an OpenMDO speak will be the forward derivatives, okay? Um, so I thought, well, I know I just learned about this adjoint method, right? Is there an equivalent adjoint for this coupled system? Okay, and so that's what uh, I derived in my thesis. Uh, and in this paper here, um, later came up in 2005, but really the derivation was done in uh, around 2000 or earlier, where um, we derived basically this um, two versions of the adjoint. This one uh, has been somewhat useless I don't know of anybody that has used it, but it exists and it should work, okay? Um, I tested this in, uh, in low fidelity first, um, don't laugh, in MATLAB, okay? And it worked for a low fidelity system, and um, so then the challenge was, okay, let's make it high fidelity. Um, so that was the first uh, couple of adjoints, and the res residual form was really the, the more useful one. Um, so, it took a long time, okay, uh, my thesis, um, I think it was five years in total, um, and, but eventually I got there with a couple that joined in high fidelity, all Fortran code, this is the slide, actual conclusions from my uh, thesis, um, 
And in this paper here, uh, actually, it was the application to a supersonic business jet. Actually, we recognize this is an area on supersonic business jet. I thought a really cool application. So it was really nice earlier uh, this year to start working with them again. Um, all right. So at the same time, right, uh, even during my thesis, I was dealing with this monolithic code in Fortran. And it was a mess. Okay, And partly it was my fault, but I inherited this. SYN 107 was a, a Jamison code, very structured, very peculiar structure, well structured, but kind of old uh, fashioned Fortran, right? And I was trying to introduce Fortran 90 features, right? And adding this in house, simple, finite element code that did wing boxes, but just barely because there were very crappy finite elements uh, in there. Um, and coupled the whole thing. The whole thing was done in Fortran in a big Fortran uh, master script, OK? A uh, bit of spaghetti code. So I thought that's got to be a better way in the future. And that's when I decided to uh, look at different languages. What could we do here to do modular and object-oriented programming? So I looked at doing uh, C++. Uh, I actually tried some prototypes with this, uh, Perl. Um, Java, uh, Python, and MATLAB. Okay, I tried all of those, and Python won. This was back in uh, 99, I believe. Um, and that eventually led to me finding out about F2Pi. There was this guy in Lithuania that was developing F2Pi, looked really uh, promising, tried it, worked very well, okay, and today works even better. Um, and I got in touch with him, and we decided to put in a paper for the Python conference. And he couldn't come from Lithuania, so I actually presented this, the paper on uh, F2Py. Um, before it was named F2Py, he actually was calling it Fortran to Python uh, Interface Generator, uh, or FPIG. Okay? So I dissuaded him from <laughs> calling it that, so it became F2Py. Um, and you can see here, uh, even though this didn't make it into my thesis, um, already had here a what became eventually, uh, those of you who know Mac, uh, I aerostruct, um, the Aerostruct script uh, in Python. Um, so starting to write the different modules in, uh, in Python and getting this barely to work. But it wasn't with a couple adjoint, it was just analysis. Um, so that led uh, to uh, future work. So as I finished my thesis, this was the long-term vision, you know, back in 2002. This is when I interviewed at Utahers for a faculty position. This was one of my last slides looking at long-term vision of this. So showing the results and then saying, well, in addition to the dynamic structure, we could propulsion, and now we have it, uh, thanks to uh, Justin, uh, and we also have mission. Um, so we're getting there. Uh, CAD is really missing here, okay? That's uh, the elephant in the room. but. Um, that's another more complicated story. OK, so um, when you look back, uh, one of the things uh, look, worked in parallel as well was the complex step method, which a lot of you are familiar with. It was more of a sidetrack. I was actually procrastinating on uh, debugging the coupled adjoint. Okay? And, uh, but this came up by accident, um, and uh, it ended up being really neat because um, Somebody showed me the formula, and I wondered if this would be applicable in general for any algorithm. Um, the answer eventually was yes, but it was not that obvious at the time. Um, and so one of the things I did was to generalize this, and um, I collaborated with uh, my office mate, uh, Peter Sturz, who is now at Arion, on this. And um, this is was my first project in Python, where I wrote a script to process Fortran code and make it uh, complex, so um, with complex numbers. Uh, not really a super sophisticated script, like not parsing a language properly, but a bit of a hack, but it worked. And it's still used today. Um, and what, even though the complex step, as you know, is not very efficient in terms of scaling with the number of variables, it was extremely useful for the verification of the coupled adjoint, okay? And it still is. And this is a point I cannot emphasize strongly enough. I see a lot of verification against finite differences, which is a start, 
but there's only so many digits that you're going to be able to verify with finite differences. And in my experience, there's a lot of bugs that happen in the other digits that are not covered with finite differences. So this is why comparing with the complex step um, is, is really useful. Um, and so that was the uh, usefulness of the complex step in, in my thesis. OK, so, um, so the second version of this framework that I did uh, with students starting as a faculty it took even longer than the original one. I would say only a few years ago that we had this uh, matured enough. Um, but it was worth it, and there were a lot of contributions uh, in, the, uh, in the process. So I want to acknowledge on the aerodynamics, it really started with um, uh, SUMB, this code from Stanford. So basically, when I graduated, I, I couldn't use any of the code that I had before. Um, and so I started from um, scratch, but I was um, shared a uh, CFT solver called SUMB uh, coming out of Stanford from uh, Juan Alonso, and we started working on an adjoint for it. So um, started working on that. Uh, Sandy Mader uh, took that over in his PhD uh, and progressed uh, a lot with it. And there were several generations of adjoints uh, making it more and more efficient. Gaten Kenway uh, had a lot of contributions there as well. Uh, and that culminated just this year with a paper where we basically summarize uh, the best practice for doing adjoints in general for CFD, or I would say this is generalizable to any system of PDEs, okay? So if you're curious about that, um, uh, check that paper. Um, on the structure side, uh, really grateful to Graham Kennedy, who basically developed a whole new um, finite elements all from scratch with adjoint derivative computation, okay? Um, one false start that we had there before uh, Graham came along was using a code um, that was, I had access to the source to a, a Portran code, uh, but it used common blocks and it was a, a real mess. I did an adjoint on that, had a couple adjoints working, but then it was just not uh, very maintainable. Um, so tax came in and really made a huge difference there. Um, implementing the coupled adjoint, of course, I'd implemented that before, but it wasn't scalable, for example, with respect to the number of coupling variables because there were some finite differences in there. So making the whole chain analytic was really um, the, uh, the key there. And uh, uh, Gaten made a lot of, uh, put a lot of work into that and, and made sure that this was uh, very efficient. Um, and finally, once we had this uh, all in place, uh, we had the first application there with the aerostructure optimization of, uh, of the common uh, research model. Uh, just to give you an idea of the adjoint before versus after, coupled adjoint, here's a comparison of the time co for computing a gradient with respect to the number of design variables. This is from my thesis. Uh, you can see the uh, complex step, the finite difference, and then the adjoint. Small slope, but still uh, 1%, right? Um, and uh, after uh, Gaten's implementation of the coupled adjoint, I really saw a big difference in the upfront cost as well as the scalability with the number of design variables, practically flat. But one key thing that's not shown here is that scalability with the number of coupling variables, which was not shown in this plot, right? Um, the coupling variables between the structures and the aerodynamics. So this is uh, one of the optimizations that this enabled. So this is the optimization of the common research model um, where we are minimizing on this side takeoff gross weight, minimizing fuel burn, uh, plant form variables, sizing variables, about 1,000 variables, including both structural sizing and aerodynamic optimization. So really uh, a high fidelity optimization of uh, unprecedented scale here, again, enabled by the coupled adjoint. Uh, so, just as an uh, information item here, the aerodynamic shape optimization part of the framework, which is called MAC, uh, the arrow part is called MAC Aero, is all open source. Uh, that's uh, new as of earlier this year. And you can see all the different components here. We have PyOpt Sparse that wraps different optimizers. Uh, we have a geometry parameterization where we can use either PyGeo, which is a freeform deformation, or uh, OpenVSP, 
we have a robust uh, volume mesh deformation. Uh, for soap simulation, we can use both uh, either AD flow or open foam. Uh, we actually developed an adjoint for open foam as well that is also open source. All right. So there's a lot in here. If you want to check it out, check these links and uh, check the code. There's also separate presentations and papers on work that has been done, um, done with this. But what I want to emphasize here is that uh, the vision from the beginning uh, with doing Python modules was to have uh, interchangeable modules where you can, for the aerodynamics, you can interchange and even use different fidelities, okay? We're not quite there yet, uh, but we want to get there um, where everything's interchangeable. So we need actually more modules to plug in here, okay? Um, okay, just, I can't resist showing a few movies, as some of you know, so <laughs> I have to show a few of examples of air damage optimization. Uh, circle going to a supercritical airfoil uh, in one optimization problem, uh, going from a random shape wing to uh, an actual optimal wing. Um, this is uh, work by uh, Ben Belge on, minima on uh, satisfying some packing constraints um, and the truss brace wing actually was funded by NASA. Okay, now rewind a bit more back to uh, MDO lab in Toronto um, where we were developing MAC, the high fidelity air social framework and um, at the same time, we were doing uh, a framework in uh, Python for that basically could um, implement different MDO architectures automatically, okay? Um, and that was PyMDO. And we presented this in 2008 at the Victoria Conference. And there, you see in the paper, we actually did this as automatic assembly of coupled derivatives, right? Uh, with finite difference derivatives over components or disciplines, right? Um, so that go, goes way back to 2008. And here's a picture of the group, MDO Lab, in 2008. If you don't recognize, that is uh, Graham right there, and Sandy, um, and myself. Um, Kai also became a, a professor at Illinois. Um, so I was really looking for a scalable or um, an MDO architecture that scaled well that was distributed, okay? Because there was a lot of talk about distributed architectures being the thing that would be implemented in industry. Um, but that was really a, a quest that was not successful, okay? We didn't find a scalable architecture that was distributed. Uh, we looked at benchmarking. All monolithic outperformed the, the distributed one, and um, we couldn't make this to be more efficient, and we couldn't come up with a distributed one that works better than this, okay? Uh, maybe someone will, right? But we didn't. Um, so actually what happened was, well, as a side effect, it was still fruitful because we got a survey done on the MDO architectures. Um, and we also uh, worked on uh, a new way to represent the systems, XCSM, uh, which is now um, uh, increasingly used. Uh, and now, when I moved the lab to Michigan, uh, well, the students stayed there, I moved. Uh, and then I built a group uh, a new group uh, going, but I continued to work with the group, uh, students in Toronto. Um, that enabled me to collaborate, the lab to collaborate with NASA. Um, and uh, you can see here the product of that. Uh, first grant was on geometry. Uh, we did a lot of aerostructural optimization here. Uh, Tim culminated with Tim's work on uh, uh, benchmark for um, the CRM and um, toe steering optimization that resulted in building and NASA testing of the, this wing box, uh, and also large-scale MDO, which is actually thanks to OpenMDO. So in this process, we had um, the unified derivative equation. So uh, for a couple of years before that, I had this idea that we could unify the methods. I was particularly interested in uh, connecting the automatic differentiation and the adjoint methods, adjoint and direct methods. Uh, and out of that came the UDE in collaboration with uh, my former student, uh, John Juan, uh, with this formula here, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, uh, and this paper. And I thought at the time that this was kind of just a curiosity. At the AIAA conference, when I presented that UDE, people, uh, my colleagues laughed at me, oh, you know, it's just equations, nothing else. Uh, but actually, John got into collaborating with 
uh, another student at the University of Michigan in solving this satellite MDO problem. And we saw then that it was actually useful because it provided the bones for a framework um, for uh, MDO. That's a monolithic framework using coupled derivatives uh, that we called MOD. Um, and that eventually led to a lot of developments. This is just the first uh, paper we're using OptimDO jointly with NASA and also uh, Andrew Ning. Um, and eventually that led to uh, OpenMDO version two. Uh, Justin hired John, came here for a year or a bit over to that, uh, implement a lot of this stuff. But I want to emphasize there was a lot more developed there uh, on top of that. So a lot of other features and other algorithms um, that were put on top of, of the original uh, mod there. Um, so in this paper earlier this year, we described all the different applications and so on. There's also open aerostruct built on top of OpenMDO. So this um, John Yasa, Jasa and um, Shamshir Chawan um, developed this. So this is a neat uh, tool for education. So uh, closing off here, um, on future work, uh, we are now working on closing the circle. So if you remember, it started with the inspiration of high fidelity aerostructural optimization, UDE, <coughs> OpenMDAO. We now want, are working on implementing high fidelity aerostructural optimization in OpenMDAO. I think that will be the, the ultimate test. Um, a number of other things here. I'm out of time, so I won't uh, cover here. But I uh, want to emphasize here, I'm preaching to the choir, but gradient-based optimization together with efficient uh, grading computation is really what enables large-scale large scale computation. We have no other way of scaling up right now. Okay, that, that's the thing we know. So I think we continue to work on that while keeping your eye open for other things. But right now, this is the, uh, what we know. Um, but also, um, the idea that there are some quests that are failed, but you have some product out of it that's still a success. Um, we ended up going back and working on the monolithic solution instead. Uh, so that re uh, <coughs> uh, resulted in mod. Um, and <coughs> Shamshir, driving up here with me, asked this question, why it took so long? I look back and take <laughs> 20 years. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of false starts. And, and the, the key here was to take this OpenMDO team and take this, uh, this some of the ideas on MDO lab. And, merging them and collaborating. That, that really made a huge difference. So the development in the last couple of years has been um, a lot more accelerated. Uh, so I'm thankful for NASA's <coughs> openness and courage to take this and to do OpenMDO version 2, especially um, Justin's leadership with this. So thanks. <clears throat> Got a few minutes for questions. Just, I'll make a comment um, to draw the link a little closer. To draw the link a little closer, if you're lucky enough to be able to go into the guts of both OpenMDO and Mach, or maybe unlucky enough, <laughs> is a better word. Um, there's a lot of structural similarities. Not everything is identical, but. A lot of the ideas that are in OpenMDO are a, a broad generalization of the work that they did at the University of Michigan. And I would call it almost like a democratization. The idea is that, why did it take 20 years? I, my suggestion would be, I think what you guys did is really impressive, but it requires somebody to like get a PhD to use it. Mm -hmm. And we needed to move to a, situ, uh, a format where that could be abstracted away. And I, I hope that's what OpenMDO is working to accomplish. So that those who are experts in MDO can come in and improve OpenMDO and can and build a tool that others can use, right? In the same way that, you know, while I vaguely know what an SQP algorithm is, I don't really know what's going on inside the SNOP framework or the optimization. I don't know all the details. Uh, I hope that OpenMDO can become that. But I, I just like to emphasize that I think that there's a lot of the groundwork that was laid here that's led into OpenMDA. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so obviously the focus here is on uh, gradient-based optimization. Maybe about a year ago, uh, a company had reached out to me, and they were really interested in more of a logistics problem, but they were dealing with a discrete problem 
And they want to understand better all the just kind of ideas which translate over to kind of discrete optimization. I didn't really have a good answer for them, but I was wondering if you have thoughts or, or how you would perhaps respond to it. I know graded bit optimization is inherent, uh, inherently assumes continuous variables. Um, so no, there's no easy answer. Can there. I can I contradict you? <laughs> well, there, can, I, can I contradict you? Yeah, go go. Um, you can't take a derivative of a discrete function. That's true, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't use gradient based and gradient free methods in concert with each other. Yeah. And in fact, we actually are doing some research in that area. We have some papers on an algorithm called Amigo, which uses like the discrete space uses a discrete algorithm and the continuous space uses a gradient based method. Uh, not going to pretend that we have everything sorted. That's, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. Mixed integer nonlinear problems are really, really hard. Um, but my opinion, I think gradient based methods have an important role to play in handling the continuous part of that space. And it's pretty rare to have a practical problem that's purely discrete, right? Well, yeah, so, so to rephrase, uh, I guess what they were more interested in is given that they actually had a, a problem that was a purely discrete, like the ability, what they liked about MGAO is the ability to break it up in sub problems. And I, I guess uh, could, could you maybe comment on some experience that, that we might have on problems where we apply those kind of methods or where well, uh, primarily discrete? Yeah, this algorithm is talking about uh, Amigo has been implemented in OpenMGAO now. So in a way, it's there already. It's just I. Um, just becomes very costly, and I, I don't like the way it scales, and so I be I, personally I've been avoiding discrete problems. I, you, you'll see some papers, <laughs> you'll see some papers I, I have on that, but mostly I, I've been avoiding those. Um, so there's there's but, definitely some there's definitely I think at the heart of your question is like is there anything that the discrete people can learn from the modularity we've yeah. built here? Yeah, I, think. I think the answer is yes. I think from both a software perspective and from a practical perspective, there's a lot of work in the topology optimization world where they solve, I don't know, Graham, what's the biggest problem? Like a 17 trillion variable optimization you've done now? Uh, those are all discrete, right? Like, but they treat them as continuous and so relaxation methods. I think there's a lot of cross-pollination that can happen. We do have a discrete variable feature in OpenMDO version two, still labeled as experimental at the moment. Um, one of the things we can discuss potentially is about whether that should graduate to a full feature. But yeah, I think that there's opportunities for both of us to learn from each other. Other questions? Yes. Maybe regarding the industry. Yeah. Uh, locally or in Europe, uh, are they uh, capable of using uh, the whole uh, aerostructure? So the question was, are, are the, folks in industry capable of using like the full aerostructural coupled high fidelity models? Like uh, by, what do you mean by? Uh, a, a standard engineer, is he capable right now? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we have made some, are you talking about the uh, Mac or OpenMDU? Both. Okay, I actually I think mean, Tim will, will give a talk kind of to that effect yeah. later about industry adoption of some of these methods. So Mac has been, uh, as you know, now being, Airbus is using it internally, not in the production, but uh, they are testing it out with engineers using it. It is a bit but of- Engineer or a PhD level? Uh, yeah, more PhD level. I mean, it's advanced, right? And it's still um, very much of a, a steep learning curve. Yeah, but it's not industrial strength you know, well-documented, well-supported code. Like OpenMDO is a lot more, uh, a lot better supported um, and a lot more documentation and so on. So, yeah. Maybe 20 years. <laughs> 20 maybe more 20 years. years more, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe we can shorten that a little bit. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.